Our third panel is dedicated to current and future directions in immigration reform and policy making. So this time we'll talk about the importance of uh, so immigration reforms and we'll try to find uh, some solutions to the existing immigration problems. Well, our first uh, uh, speaker is a professor of uh, uh, assistant professor um, in the psychology department at our college, Dr. Daniel Kaplan. Uh, his research examines how religious beliefs and practices influence mental health. Uh, he has also worked to improve the uh, treatment and access to care for ethnic minorities. Um, lastly, he does attitudinal research on prescriptive authority for psychologists. Um, he is uh, the 2019 president-elect for New York State Psychological Association. Moreover, he was the 2018 president of NYSBA's division of culture, race, and ethnicity, and New York State diversity delegate to the American Psychological Association's practice leadership conference in 2015 and 2016. He has uh, many awards and recognitions, and uh, uh, today uh, he will shed light on the importance uh, of such social uh, reforms and why it is so Im um, important for us to do something um, about current immigration crisis. So um, his uh, um, presentation is on the harmful effect of hate speech, structural oppression, marginalization, and discrimination on bicultural identity. Today's political climate revisited. So it is customary to begin with acknowledgments. And before I go any further, Dr. Lamack has been absolutely phenomenal in organizing today's conference. Um, under the guidance of Dr. Fatari and Dr. Gielin. So we are in great company and my esteemed panelists, thank you. Um, before I go into my remarks, the, being the third panel of the day has its benefits. You get to hear what your colleagues have said and try and tie it into your remarks. So throughout the day I've been writing these copious notes and we'll see how well I do. Um, but the first thing I'm going to talk about is what we're experiencing is not a Trump effect exclusively. Um, Anti-immigration laws can go all the way back to the 1800s. And I'm just going to remind us of a couple, right? So we have the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, which limited uh, Chinese immigrants coming through. We had the Anarchist Exclusion Act, which limited those who were prostitutes, beggars, epileptics. So if you had seizure condition, you were limited. And of course, atheists. Um, we had the Married Women Act, which if a woman married a person from another nation, she lost her citizenship for marrying that man. We had the Quota Act, we had Operation Wetback, and now we have our current uh, travel bans and a whole host of issues with uh, our wonderful, sarcastically, President Trump. Uh, now, if you're interested in anti-immigration law, I will tell you that Kathleen Arnold wrote a two-volume series on this entitled Anti-Immigration in the United States. So that gives a little bit of backdrop. And then related to the uh, current political climate, I would say, and uh, that was the shocker or the hook, I would say it's bad science to present Donald Trump as the singular cause, an emphasis on cause, 
of the difficult challenges that immigrants are facing today. Rather, I see Donald Trump as a more recent vehicle for the anti-immigrant rhetoric. And in terms of anti-Muslim um, experience in immigration, Professor Khalid uh, Beydoun, which is a law professor at the University of Arkansas, wrote America Islamophobia, Understanding the Roots and Rise of Fear. And this point of Islamophobia being around before Trump, before the travel ban, he very eloquently does. So that's another resource for you. All right, you don't need much of that. That was already said. All right, so the way I'm gonna structure this talk is I'm gonna first start with some relatively famous quotes, and I'd like to reflect on what it means for the identity of the person who hears that quote. Then we're gonna talk about whether rhetoric has any impact. Uh, then we're gonna talk about identity factors, and then I'm gonna turn it over to the panelists. So, if we were to look at the first quote, and I'm sorry I'm gonna turn my back to you, it says, when Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're not sending you, they're not sending you. They're sending people that have lots of problems. They're, they're bringing those problems with us. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crimes, they're rapists, and I assume some are good people. Now, what that highlights, if we're to look at that, uh, is a concept of a fear appeal. And in psychology, Maddox and Rogers talked about a fear appeal is a very powerful way to get people to buy into your perspective. So if they are called murderers and rapists, well, we don't want them, right? Going right, that would be the fear. So let's keep them outside of our borders. So. Uh, in fact, Jojo earlier, when he brought this up, he talked about the reaction to this, this identity of fear is to increase toughness. And that's what Trump did, right? Um, so, the next thing, notably related to, okay, not notably related to Muslims is, Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what the hell is going on. Now, you'll see the date on that. That date is two years prior to the travel ban. So true to his word, he was calling for a total shutdown. Now, he has waffled in his quotes back and forth. And if you want a gold mine of lack of stability of self, just read his quotes. But in this, it highlights uh, inflammatory nature uh, towards a targeted minority, Muslims in particular. Other quotes that I didn't put there is, I think Muslims hate us. This is one of his quotes. Uh, another quote, which is probably even more famous than these other two, is they, Muslims, were cheering as the buildings were coming down. So another strategy, if you want to induce prejudice and hate, is to highlight vivid cases. And there's no stronger case or vivid case than 9-11. Now, there's one plus billion Muslims in the world. You cannot judge a whole group by the acts of a few, right? But that vivid case is powerful in attitude formation. Also, scapegoating, right? So this highlights scapegoating. Uh, so be mindful that uh, some of the messages, the two targeted minorities that I'm going to focus on are Muslims and Central Americans, or the Latin community. So DACA. Now DACA is used to allow children to maximize their potential in the United States. So they are childhood arrivals. Now. Uh, some of what Donald Trump has implied is that they're bad people, they're criminals and whatnot, but he ignores the fact that in order to be eligible for DACA, you have to reapply every two years, and you have to be a law-abiding citizen. If you ever commit a crime, you're out. You can't reapply. Uh, you have to pay taxes. 
and you have to be an upstanding member of society. So all of these things um, bode well for immigration, right? If, if I were to look at immigration, I would say immigrants, every generation of immigrants have actually changed our country for the better. That's the way I see it. But there's this fear of these childhood arrivals. And sure enough, he says, we will immediately terminate President Obama's two illegal executive amnesties related to DACA, and in which he defied federal law and the Constitution to give amnesty to about five million illegal immigrants. Now, the numbers are off. There's about 800,000 DACA recipients. So that even that number could be fact-checked. But the idea of saying, hey, these childhood arrivals are going to contaminate the country uh, is problematic. Chain migration. So chain migration allows people from a particular uh, location to bring those who are related to them or from the same area involved. Now, uh, Joseph Gerges talked about uh, the idea of family relatedness in this process. So typically, chain migration occurs as a function of your family member, you could bring another family member in. Uh, and President Trump's words are, chain migration cannot be allowed to be part of any legislation related to immigration. The irony is his wonderful wife, her parents, benefited from this chain migration. Right? Actually this year or within the last 12 months. So that it's interesting the, the points that are being made. Um, so we go on. Birthright citizenship. Birthright citizenship was threatened. Uh, So-called birthright citizenship which cost our country billions of dollars and is unfair to our citizen will be ended one way or another. Now birthright citizenship by definition is that no matter where you're from or where your parents are from, if you're born in this country, you're automatically granted citizenship. So he wants to undo that. There's one problem, and I'm not a lawyer, so hopefully the lawyers will fact check me. This is protected under the 14th Amendment. So he would have a constitutional crisis if he wants to try and do this. Uh, but nevertheless, there is that fear there. And then asylum. Um, this was the last quote that got some publicity this month. This is our new statement. The system is full. We cannot take you anymore. Whether it's asylum or anything you want, we cannot take you anymore. Our country is full. Our area is full. The sector is full. Can't take you anymore. I'm sorry. Turn around. Now, Dr. Ayuti and, and, and Jojo highlighted this point too, as we have a humanitarian crisis on our hands. Uh, people don't seek asylum or refugee status from comfortable places. More often than not, they're seeking due to persecution. And we have historically been, aspired to be a nation of immigrants, etched on the bottom of the Statue of Liberty is give me your huddled masses, right? We've drifted very far from Ellis Island and Liberty Island. Okay, why is it? All right. So at this point, that's the first segment. We know uh, President Trump's quotes. We've seen its impact on various groups related to immigration. We've talked about the concept of a fear appeal. We've talked about scapegoat theory. We've, we've talked about vivid cases and how they're used in negative ways. But at this point, what's the big deal? It's just words, right? Who cares? In fact, there's a debate on our First Amendment on the limitations of freedom of speech. And currently, I know this isn't the case in Canada, but currently even hate speech is protected in the United States, which is kind of bizarre. In Canada, not so much. But, so it's just speech. Well, 
One thing that we know is attitudes and behaviors are directly linked. So the first problem with this set of speech is that we know hate speech results in hate crimes. We know there's a, a direct link to that. So if we were to look at whether it's the FBI statistic, the Southern uh, Poverty Law Review or Pew Research Forum, we know that in the last three years, hate crimes have gone up. Now, as I said, it would be bad science to declare a causal relationship, but there is a correlation there. And the groups that have been targeted with this rise most are ethnic minorities, religious minorities, and sexual minorities, right? Of the statistics we see, they're the highest three groups that are targeted. Naturally, the Latin immigration community would be affected, and naturally, the Muslim community would be affected by these changes in culture. So if we were to look at it, so I, I reference the FBI statistics that um, anti-Semitism is the highest religious hate crime reported so far according to FBI statistics. But what we've seen is that's followed by uh, anti-Muslim hate crimes. And if we were to track the spike in the last three years, the, the slope has gone up higher with Muslims than Jews, right? So the trajectory of hate crimes for our Muslims, if we're gonna keep down this road, is actually gonna, it may surpass it at one point. Now I'm hoping that that's not the case. But uh, the trajectory is higher. And we, we see there's research that says these hate crimes result in psychological distress. For example, suboptimal health. Dr. Uh, Villalon, right, Villalon, uh, highlighted some of the health impact of immigration. So they have suboptimal health, and when they experience hate crimes, um, they're less likely to report it. So it's interesting. So you're experiencing this, and you're less likely to report it. So the question is, um, why? because you identify a target on your back. So if you're an undocumented Latin individual or if you are a Muslim, which is a targeted minority group, you don't want to draw attention to yourself. So many of these are, are underreported and go unreported, which is quite sad. So here's the UN's re response to this. This was uh, the Human Rights Commission in November 2018. And in one of their plenary sessions, they had a whole discussion on, on that. Um, and what they, what they found was that we have a civic responsibility to manage the media. Not to manage the media and freedom of press, but the idea, what we put out there can be harmful. So they acknowledge that there is a potential harm involved in hate speech, right? So there is a movement to uh, take more responsibility for the speech presented. So problem number two is that it results in marginalization, right? So when we talk about marginalization, there's a whole, the travel ban, which is, I actually call that a very poorly veiled Muslim ban, right? So the, tr the, the travel ban um, results in uncertainty, and it affects the psychological status of all members of society. Um, and one of the research studies uh, highlighted its impact in the schools, right? So something as simple as a travel ban can affect the person in school. Um, same thing with Latin communities, right? Living in the shadows. Now, here's just two quick examples, and I know I'm running short on time. Um, I think I have, what, two, three minutes based on that clock? It, I have 20 minutes, right? All right, we'll, we'll negotiate. <laughs> but how many of you are familiar with the 2017 travel ban? So uh, one of uh, the CUNY students uh, at Graduate Center was impacted. There was a question whether she might be able to finish her degree. So uh, aside from teaching at St. Francis, I've taught at the College of Staten Island for 13 years. So the, the, the CUNY identity is part of me as well. So. Uh, ultimately, she was allowed to come in, but that's one thing. But I'd like to show you an email I got 
about people being picked up on the streets. Check this out. Now, I blacked out the name of the person, but I got an email saying, hey, someone's no longer in your class or no longer going to be coming to your class because they were picked up by ICE and we have no further information. Holy crap. Right? When I think about that, that is, it's, it's one thing to know about it from afar, but to get a personal email saying that this is happening is incredibly alarming. So there is a marginalization effect. Uh, the third and final problem, third and final problem is related to identity, a threat to identity. So when a person migrates, they have their home country and they have their host country, the goal is that they should be able to blend the two and have a beautiful integration, right? And that's what we call bicultural identity. What happens when you have this persecution is that they feel they still have that connection to their home country, but there is a negative experience in their host country. What does that result in? Rejection. So here are some statistics on uh, the threat to bicultural identity or in the Muslim context and in the Latin context. Long story short, there is a stronger sense of rejection. A culture of stress. Moving from one place to another is stressful. Moving from one country to another is even more stressful. When you put this hate rhetoric, uh, it's incredibly more powerful. So uh, what uh, Tartakovsky did was he talked about pre and post migration. And on the right side of the dashes, that's all the post uh, immigration rhetoric and how that's going to affect your experience. Now, so uh, being told that you are a criminal or a murderer adds to that stress. So, what can we do? Here, uh, I'd like to go back to uh, Dr. al Yudi, which said he wanted six things from you. Uh, the form of migration has three foci, right? Uh, research, practice, and advocacy. So, the first thing you could do is research. Who supports Donald Trump, right? Now, that's, a, that's an important question. And what would make someone support Donald Trump? Well, one factor associated with support for, with Donald Trump is something called mortality salience. I'm going to go back to the fear appeal. If I get you to think about the possibility of your own death, you tend to become more conservative in your belief set. So this is a study that I had the privilege of doing with Sheldon Solomon, who's the originator of the theory, and Florent Cohen. And what we were able to find is that people tended to become more supportive of Republican ideals, more conservative ideals, when they were primed with the thought of their own death. Last but not least, advocacy. Speak out. Here are just three examples of what you can do. I've leveraged every one of my uh, positions to speak out. So here's an example of, with New York State Psychological Association, various statements that unfortunately we've had to put out. Right, the most recent, one was the New Zealand massacre, right? And we're working one on Sri Lanka. But when you see something related to immigration or travel, or something related to marginalizing a group, don't stand silent, be an ally. So leverage your abilities, think about what you can do, and speak out. This uh, presentation will be delivered by um, Mark Drucker, uh, who is presently an adjunct professor at the Graduate um, uh, Center of um, the CUNY. Uh, in 1979, uh, Mark Drucker founded the Drucker Law Firm in Jackson Heights uh, with specialization in immigration and nationality law. Uh, he has served as an arbitrator with the Civil Court of the City of New York, Queens County, and has lectured to various groups on immigration law. Mr. Drucker has been actively involved in the American Immigration Lawyers Association since 1980 and is also an esteemed member of the Queens County Bar Association. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for all staying here and staying awake. Hopefully I'll keep you awake. Uh, thank you, Dr. Womack and Daniel. That was a great presentation. I think this is a, a great segue into uh, easy fixes or simple fixes to our immigration law. I've got a section, I don't know if someone wants to hand out, just one of the sections of the law that I wanted to talk about. 
Uh, since I've been practicing law in, in Jackson Heights, people have been waiting for changes in the law. I mean, they're always saying, what can I do? When is it going to change? How is it going to change? And the last time I think there really was a change was under Ronald Reagan, a conservative president. And uh, he basically put in the legalization program, which allowed people who were here before 1981 and people who worked on farms for more than 90 days to qualify for a temporary resident status, which eventually got them their permanent resident status. Since then, I think there's been a, a number of proposed changes. One, I think, by President George H.W. Bush, where it passed the House but didn't pass the Senate. And then recently there was a, another proposed change, I think it was by President Obama, and I think the Senate approved it, but the House did not. That was the Comprehensive Immigration Reform Bill. So thinking about this, I said, you know what? It's going to be very, very difficult to get uh, bilateral or both houses of Congress really to agree on any one particular bill. And in my practice in Jackson Heights, we have a lot of undocumented people. And they're looking, you know, they've been here for years, they've been paying their taxes, they've been living a pretty, you know, good life, they have children born here, no criminal record, and they want to see what they can do. So the scenario that I usually see, and they come into my office even last, yesterday actually, a woman comes in, she's been here since uh, 19... Uh, 98, February of 98, came in through the border without inspection, lived here continuously, paying her taxes. She's got now uh, two U.S. citizen children. Her oldest one just turned 21, went to St. Francis College, got his degree, and now he wants to petition for his mom. Sounds easy enough, right? He's a citizen, he's over 21, he should be able to petition, and she should be able to get her green card. But what happens? She can't adjust her status here because she came in without inspection. And she's not qualified for the 245I, which allows some people who came here illegally, but they had to have a case filed before uh, 2001, eight, April 30th. They had to have a petition filed and they had to be living here before December 21st of 2000. So she's not qualified for that. And they said, oh, well, what about a waiver? You know, there are waivers in the immigration law that allow people to go home and come back. And there is a, such a, a law called the 601A waiver that if you have a parent here or a spouse here who's a resident or citizen, they could qualify you to get this waiver. So you go to your embassy and you come right back, usually in a week or two. That's great, right? But what happens in the scenario that we just gave you? She doesn't have a parent, she doesn't have a spouse, she's just got the child here, right? So this is uh, a big problem because she has nothing really to, to get her residence here. So to start a petition, let her pay a lot of money and give her the false hope that she can get her residence really is not something that I want to do. Uh, so I came up with these three fixes, I think, that don't require uh, major changes. They, Congress doesn't have to debate it and debate it and debate it. It's already in the law. And the one that I think you just basically we handed out is Section 249 of the Immigration Act. And not too many people know about this section because it's not really used because you had to be here before January 1 of 1972. Now that's a long time ago, right? You're talking about 40, 46, 47 years ago. So not too many people are, can establish that they qualify for that section. But they, it's, this section has been amended over the years. And that's all we have to do is amend this section to an entry date of January 1 of 2005. And if you, anyone who was here before January 1, 2005 has no criminal record, can establish that they've been paying taxes for five years, would qualify to adjust their status here, get their permanent residence. 
I don't think it's asking that much because people would have to show that they've been living here continuously for that would be 14 years with taxes. And I think that would solve a lot of the problems because these people then could apply for work permits and get driver's license and really make their lives much simpler. Uh, so that would be one fix I would suggest. The other fix is when we're talking about the waiver. And the waiver only is good for people who have a parent here or a spouse here. But what's wrong with giving the waiver to people who have children here? Uh, I, President Obama, when he tried to get, he got the DACA through and then put in a regulation, what's called DAPA, for parents who had children born here. But as you probably recall, one of the courts down south, I think it was in Texas, said that he didn't have the authority to do that. And therefore, it was basically ruled unconstitutional, and that's where it went. I think it went up to the Fifth Circuit, and the Fifth Circuits tend to be very conservative, and it never went beyond that. But again, if you put in this provision under the waiver provision that children would suffer extreme hardship, I think most people would be able to qualify for that waiver because children tend to, you know, they would suffer hardship if they had to go to Mexico or any place else when they're already in school here, they're acculturated here, they're, they're friends, their whole psychological being is right here in the States. To throw them in another country uh, would be probably extreme. So I think that would uh, make it much easier and again, wouldn't require Congress to do much other than to extend the, the waiver provisions to, uh, to children. And I think that would include a lot of people. And I think it would also go along with the whole conservative mentality that people should leave the country and come back in legally. And that's been going on with this waiver because people do leave and they come back in a week and they're very happy and it works. So uh, I think that might solve a lot of uh, the problems with some of the Republican side of, of Congress that say, hey, look, we don't want to give away the store. We don't want another legalization program. We don't want an amnesty. Well, this is not an amnesty. They're leaving the country, and then they're coming back illegally. They have to show taxes and all that kind of thing. So I think that could, uh, could work. Uh, and then the third provision, the third simple fix, is there's a section I talked to you a little bit about before, Section 245I of the Immigration Act. So Section 245 allows people to adjust their status in the United States if they came in legally and were inspected and admitted. Well, 245I says, okay, even if you weren't inspected and admitted or came in as a crewman or some other type of visa that would prohibit you from getting your residence, if you could show that someone tried to sponsor you through a, a job or through a family connection, a brother, sister, whatever it is, you would then have to pay a penalty and still apply for your adjustment of status here. So again, that's a win-win because we could charge, or the USCIS could charge. Now they charge a thousand. You could up it to two thousand. I think people would be happy to pay the two thousand dollars and still not have to leave the country. A lot of people are very afraid of leaving the country, even if you assure them they're coming back. They say, "I'm not taking a chance. I got my kids here. I don't want to go." So this would uh, uh, allow people to pay the penalty, and they just would have to show that they've been sponsored. Uh, I put down here on my proposed date of being sponsored by January 15th of 2010, but that could be flexible. But you have to have an employer, and we have a lot of employers, whether or not they're uh, elderly people who have a home attendant or a skilled job, whether it's a shoemaker or uh, uh, some type of gardener, and these people really are dependent on them and they can't find American workers. So if you get sponsored, and you can show that this sponsorship has been approved and you've got the wherewithal to establish that you've been living here all this time since whatever date, we said the 2010 date, you'll be eligible to get your adjustment of status here. And I think that again would solve a lot of problems because even then, if they had children here who may be out of status or illegally here, you could then include them in your adjustment of status application. 
So I think it, both of, of three of these solutions are all basically win-wins because they allow people, I think we've got now, I think it's close to 11 million undocumented people here in the United States. I think that was the last number I saw. Uh, and what are we going to do with them? You know, I think that's, you know, everybody said, well, you've got to change the law. Well, no one wants to change the law because they're also afraid that it's going to be put on them that they're granting a legalization or they're giving away the store or something like that. So I think with these three fixes, everybody can say, take a deep breath and say, oh, we're not giving away anything here. We're just making it easier. The law has is is been in place all these years. So I, I think it will help my, my practice in Jackson Heights to give people some hope that there is a chance that things can get better. And uh, I think in the last number of years, we've seen people who are actually just giving up and going home. And then they call me two or three years later, I want to come back. Well, as most people know, if you're here unlawfully for more than one year, once you leave the country, you can't come back for 10 years. So that's a pretty harsh penalty. And some people kind of leave, you know, think, ah, I can do better in, in my country. But then it's when they find out they can't, they have regrets. Anyhow, thank you all for uh, staying awake. And uh, hopefully, uh, you learned something. Our next uh, panelist is uh, Heath Brown, uh, Dr. Heath Brown. He's an associate professor of public policy at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice, CUNY, and graduate uh, center. He has worked at the United States Congressional Budget Office as a research fellow um, at the American uh, um, Bar Association as a policy assistant and at the Council of Graduate Schools as research and policy director. Well, in addition to his research, uh, Dr. Brown is reviews editor for interest groups and advocacy and hosts a podcast called New Books in Political Science. Um, he also is author of several books. Um, actually, his very impressive bio is in our program, and we're um, short of time, but I'll just list a couple of those titles. Lobbying the New President, Tea Party Divided, Play-to-Play -play Politics, uh, um, Immigrants and Electoral Politics, and coming, right? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. The uh, one thing that was missing from my bio that is um, uh, my fault is the thing that I'm most proud of is that I'm from Brooklyn. Uh, I was born, I don't know, five blocks from here, uh, Brooklyn Hospital. Anyone else born at Brooklyn Hospital here? Uh, it's a great hospital to be born at. Uh, my mother, an immigrant from Canada, uh, owned a flower shop just three blocks from here, and so I have a particularly fond place for Brooklyn Heights and for St. Francis College. So thank you all for having me. Um, thank you so much. Um, I ran into a problem, which is my phone, the battery is done. Anyone ever have that problem? Right, right in the middle, your phone is dead and you want to do something with it. So uh, would, would anyone mind, uh, anyone on Twitter, anyone, uh, a social media user of any sort? There must be some more out there. I'm sure at least one person here is a social media user. Would someone, would you take, would you like, would take a picture of us and share it on, do you have a large follow, do you have a lot, oh, okay. Does anyone have a large following? Uh, no, no, okay, so you have the largest following here. You could take it from right there because I'd like to share with the world this amazing uh, event. Um, what I'm going to be doing is to, to share um, uh, in, in the goal of trying to provide some very specific and concrete feedback about what to do. Uh, I think the panels that have preceded this one have laid a lot of foundation and a lot of major concerns. Uh, concerns that many of us may have come to today knowing about, uh, we know about in a great deal more detail now. And so, what I uh, uh, imagine this panel as, and it seems as if this is exactly what it is, which is trying to make sense of what to do. And I approach uh, the world and I approach my research looking at organizations. 
specifically organizations that represent and serve immigrants. And so the research I'm going to be presenting just a little bit of is about those kinds of organizations, which is what we call nonprofit organizations, organizations that are trying to do something for the world. This includes student organizations. Um, are any of you in a, in a student organization? St. Francis College has lots and lots of student organizations. Is anyone here in a student organization? Can I see any hands? For all of you, for the one person who is in a student organization here, for the two people who are in student organizations, this presentation is very much for you. Uh, because the goal of it is to provide five things that you as an organizational leader can do to try to change the conversation about immigration in the future. And so that's really the goal here. Uh, the research that I'm talking about here is from a survey that I did just a couple of years ago in six different states, including New York and New Jersey, North Carolina, Florida, uh, and Illinois and Pennsylvania as well. What I did was to ask uh, the organizations that serve immigrants, that is, uh, uh, that serve immigrants of different generations, those that are first generation, second generation, uh, those that are undocumented, uh, those communities that have been in the country for a long time, and I asked them a pretty simple question, which is, are you involved at all in electoral politics? Just a simple question. Uh, and what I found was, similar to what we know about the voting rates of immigrants, which is lower than for other communities in the United States, what I found was that 60% said that they weren't involved at all. Now, given what we've just heard today about the fraught position of immigrants and immigration in this country, the fact that six in 10 organizations that claim to represent and serve immigrants aren't involved at all during election season raises some real questions. It also raises some opportunities. That is, if you can increase the number of organizations that are doing something to represent immigrants during the electoral period, maybe things could get a little bit better. So uh, what I found in addition to that is that those 40% of organizations that were doing at least one thing were really only doing just one thing. That is, they weren't doing a lot during election season. They were doing just, just one thing. And what they typically did was the most sort of limited thing that an organization can do. What this gives is percentages across different kinds of tactics, ranging from monitoring the news about elections all the way up through issuing policy briefs. And the most frequent thing that organizations do is to simply monitor the news. Now, that's the most passive thing that an organization can do. You're just sort of watching the news. You're paying attention to what's going on in the newspapers on your issues. It's a good thing, but perhaps not a sufficient thing to advance the interests of those people that uh, these organizations try to serve. And so part of the argument that I'm making is that if you could increase the number of organizations that are doing the things listed here, which I'll talk about in more detail, including registering voters, mobilizing voters, provided translated voter information, perhaps one of the most important things that an immigrant organization can do is to collect up the information that's being provided to the entire community in English and translate it into a, the language that their community speaks first. We have laws that make that uh, an obligation on election day, but that doesn't mean in the weeks and months leading up to the election, better information could be provided to communities in the languages that they speak at home. That could transform the electorate if people were better informed in the language that they speak uh, uh, about what's going on in the election. So uh, what I wanted to do was to make an, uh, a call for uh, five things that organizations can do. The first thing that an organization can do is to be authentic with, with the, strategy, uh, the political strategies that they use. When I talked to the leaders of immigrant, uh, immigrant serving organizations, they gave me these kinds of answers that you would see on the board. These are the reasons they don't get involved in elections. And it ranges from fear to a lack of information about what the laws are to a question about the partisanship of the organizations they represent. These are the barriers. If organizations were able to figure out how to address these areas of concern, they would be able to move from passive participants in elections 
to active participants in elections. And if they were able to do that, they would have the potential to transform the electorate. So the first thing you have to do is figure out what is the authentic voice of our organization. The second thing that an organization represent, representing immigrants might do is to get involved here in registering uh, those in their communities to vote. As you may know, in most states in the country, we don't have same-day registration. That means if you show up to the polls and you're not registered, you're not permitted to vote. This means that you have to register in advance. How many of you are registered to vote in the 2020 election? Okay, if organizations at St. Francis College took on the task in, of making sure that every eligible student, every one of you that is perfectly eligible to vote was registered to vote, again, you could transform the politics of this, uh, of this borough, of the city, uh, even uh, uh, trans uh, transformational effects that are quite beyond that. I saw maybe 60% or so of the, of the students raise their hand. That means there's a huge potential for electoral uh, participation if the organizations here, student organizations, took it upon themselves to make sure that every single student was registered to vote who was eligible to vote. The third thing uh, that I think matters a lot and is something that immigrant organizations can do is to tell the story of the community. One of the biggest effects that Donald Trump has had is to use his influence to change the story about immigrations. The um, presentation that you just heard, I think, gave a very good snapshot into the way in which Donald Trump has been able to do that. But this is something that organizations can respond to. They can respond uh, by telling their story in the press. There is this new uh, journalism project called Documented New York. This is a sort of a snapshot from their website. It's based here. Their mission is to tell the story. Does anyone read this, this, this news outlet? If you don't, and you are interested in immigration and immigrants in New York City, you must, you must go to their website and read on a daily basis the, the stories that they are telling. They are taking it as their mission to tell the local stories of New York. This is a mission that the New York Daily News, the New York uh, Times, and the New York Post do not have. They do not take it upon themselves to tell the stories of the immigrants of this city. Documented does, and for that reason, it's a way in which organizations can tell their stories and elevate the stories that they know internally and make sure that the world knows them as well. So this is the third thing that you can do. The fourth thing you can do is to use technology. One of the things that you hear from organization leaders is that to get involved in politics is just too expensive, and it is. There are all sorts of electoral tactics that are expensive, but technology has greatly lowered the cost and lowered the need of expertise to be involved in things like phone banking. That is to make sure that you can use technology to its best advantage. Organizations, especially organizations that serve young people, have a unique opportunity in the future at a relatively low cost to participate uh, during election season. 20 years ago, this would have been much, much more expensive to do. Today, if you simply want to communicate uh, the date of an election, and one of the things we know about elections in the United States is they don't just happen on a single date. They happen all around the year. There's probably an election in two weeks that we don't even know about. Right? So that, that providing information now has become very easy, very inexpensive uh, through the tools that we all use on a regular basis. If you have that kind of expertise and you can share it in an internship, we heard about internships earlier, if you can share it with, with one of these organizations that feels like they lack the expertise to engage in social media, that would be an enormous gift that you'd be able to give back to your community, using your expertise to help them in a specific way in the form of an internship. And so using technology is the, the fourth thing. And then finally, joining a coalition. In New York City, there is a long-standing immigrant uh, coalition that, that makes sure all of the organizations in the city uh, are working in, in sort of in tandem. Uh, making sure that they're learning from the best practices of other organizations. New York City isn't alone in this. In North Carolina, this is a map of North Carolina. Has anyone ever been to North Carolina? 
Uh, I went to college in North Carolina. North Carolina is very different. Let me tell you, North Carolina is very, very different. But increasingly, in the area of where immigrants live, North Carolina is a center. It's a hub of where new immigrants are deciding to locate. As much as New York City, the areas outside of Charlotte, North Carolina, are, are where the, the opportunities and also the greatest threats to immigrants are today. And in North Carolina, of all places, there are organizations scattered about the state that are brought together in this coalition. Uh, for organizations that are worried that getting involved in politics, getting involved in elections is too risky, is too expensive, is something that is outside of their mission, joining a coalition of other, other organizations is one way to reduce the costs, reduce the fear, and amplify the voice of the communities they serve. So, these five different things, if you did just one of those, if you encourage the organizations that you might know about, that you're going to volunteer for in the future, if you can encourage those organizations to do just one of those things, or maybe two, or three, or four, or maybe even five, the possibility of trans, uh, transforming politics on the issues that these organizations care about, I think is limitless. Uh, thank you very much for your time, and uh, look forward to the next presentation. Uh, so our next presentation uh, will be delivered by um, Dr. Brotherton. Um, David Brotherton is Professor of Sociology, Urban Education, and Criminal Justice at uh, John Jay College of Criminal Justice and the Graduate Center. Um, and director of the Social Change and Transgressive Studies Project at John Jay College. In 2011, he was named Critical Criminologist of the Year, and in 2015, he received the Praxis Award for Contributions to Social Justice from the Division of Critical Criminology and the American Society of Criminology. Um, Dr. Brotherton is the founding editor of the Transgressive Studies book series at Temple University Press. His books include Immigration, Immigration Policy in the Age of Punishment, Youth Street Gangs, Banished to the Homeland, The Almighty Latin King and Queen Nation, Street Politics and the Transformation of a New York City Gang. Thanks for the <coughs> welcome, uh, inviting me, and uh, it's a great privilege to be here with you guys. Um, so I left my uh, talk on my table, I live in Park Slope, and I jumped on the, the city bike and uh, in haste to get here and uh, left everything on the table, so I just have to uh, look at what I wrote on the computer. If I bring this up, hang on a sec. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, so I've been studying um, deportation. Hello? Okay. It's good. It's good. It works. Yeah, so, <laughs> whoa. Okay, so um, I've been studying deportation for uh, nearly two decades, 17 years, uh, 18 years actually. Um, and actually, it was the first criminologist. Uh, to study uh, this area. Um, believe it or not, when I started studying this in 2001, uh, sociologists were writing about uh, almost exclusively assimilation and integration. No one was writing about the masses that were being expelled already between 1996 and 2001, especially from New York City, around about eight to 9,000 a year were being expelled. During that time, nearly 70,000 people, and no one's writing about them. The, uh, they're mostly uh, people of colour, so there's a whole racial element to deportation. Many of them were long time residents here Dominicans, Jamaicans, Haitians, uh, Chinese heritage folks uh, were being kicked out. That's in the early days. Not now. Now, we have something like, from just New York City alone, over a quarter of a million people have been expelled permanently from this city. 
after 1996, it's very important, because 1996 was the, uh, the draconian immigration laws, I'm going to talk about in a second, that made deportation based on not what you've done now necessarily, in terms of any kind of criminal offence, but what you may have done 15 or 20 years ago, because the law is retroactive. It also ended almost any waiver. It didn't matter if you had family here, you had five children, you had a wife, you had your mum, your grandfather, it didn't matter, you had a good job, it didn't matter, you went to Cooney, got a graduate degree, had a PhD, well, it didn't matter. What reason you had to stay here, there was no exception. There are exceptions, are one, uh, if you can prove that uh, by uh, weight of evidence, that um, when you're dying, the government uh, is going to kill you or torture you, or its agents will be implicit therein, or complicit therein, or that your partner's going to kill you, mainly if you're a woman, because it comes under the uh, Violence Against Women's Act. That's the only way you can get out of it. Or if you can prove that one of what's happened in the past that uh, gave you a felony was really a misdemeanor and there was some kind of mistake. So people who are in deportation proceedings, who are green card holders like me, we're not talking about undocumented folks, something like 97% get deported. That's the rate. In New York City, it's different, and it's different to every other part of the country because we're the only city that guarantees a detainee legal representation. We're the only ones. No one else does it. And so this legal representation, which has been uh, enforced since about 2014, courtesy of the uh, uh, City Council, and where it's 97% certain that you're going to be deported down in this city, it's based, based on uh, CATS, what we call Convention Against Torture and Violence Against Women, it goes down to about 60% certain that you're going to be deported, right? So we live uh, in a very special place. In terms of fighting for the immigrant, in terms of fighting and resisting deportation, it's better here than anywhere else. And yet all around New York City are detention camps. You've probably never heard of. Hudson County, Bergen County, Elizabeth. All of upstate, Bativa, uh, the um, massive facility, Eastern Penitentiary facility, teeming with detainees. So bad at the moment, the many detainees can't shower for two to three days at a time. Because there's not enough time to go into that compartment to wash yourself down. So we live, and I'm not sure what other folks have been saying here, but we live in very dangerous times. Very precarious times. And it kind of shocks me, to be frank, that we can go on in our everyday life, for the most part, as if not too much is happening. As many of my friends who went through Germany in the 1930s, they remind me that we're in those kinds of times. Right? And we have a president who actually uses very similar language from the 1930s. So let me get down to what I'm going to talk about today. We're throwing MS-13 the hell out of here so fast. We're cracking down hard on the foreign criminal gangs that have brought illegal drugs, violence, horrible bloodshed to peaceful neighborhoods all across our country. We're liberating our towns. And we're liberating our cities. Can you believe we have to do that? Trump, July 25, 2017, at Youngstown, Ohio. These infamous words of the present elect are not simply slips of the tongue shoot from the hip outpourings of an unhinged political animal who accidentally became one of the most powerful men in the world. No, they are the ideological perspectives of a branch or block of a ruling class that has reaped enormous benefits for what is sometimes referred to as casino capitalism, a form of capital and wealth accumulation 
that comes essentially from global speculation, employs methods of profit extraction that some refer to as gangster capitalism. For a better understanding of this, please see uh, the case of uh, President Trump in Trump Inc. on National Public Radio. But for the purposes of this talk, I want to focus on the elevated forms of social expulsion and exclusion that we observe and experience in the United States. As this block and its agents literally attempt to free the nation state from its invading hordes. I argue that the terms used here are not accidental, but are born of the conviction that the time has come for a form of social cleansing, a new form of extraction in which immigrant bodies are removed literally from a newly imagined sovereign state in which the US passed as an extraordinarily violent and game end game of occupation of settler, of settler colonialism never existed. In order to do this, the state has created this strange, amorphous phenomenon I refer to as the ice machine. To understand this phenomenon in its new New York City context, we and John Jay and Cooney uh, established a research project called The Social Anatomy of the Deportation Regime, in which faculty and students are carrying out the first case study of this regime and of ICE in the United States. And on Monday, we have a major conference, uh, John Jay, if you want to come to it, all day that showcases the findings of this uh, ongoing project. But in this talk, I discuss two essential aspects of this machine and its regime, which relate to the theory and practice of structural violence and what we call necro politics, vis a vis the phenomenon of deportation and the ICE regime. Machine. I draw on my own theoretical and empirical studies of deportation that have stretched over 18 years. Uh, right, and I, much of my work, earlier work, anyway, was on the deportation of Dominicans back to the Dominican Republic. Structural violence refers to the systemic social arrangements that inflict social harm on individuals by depriving them of their basic human rights to exist, often leading to their permanent death, their, their premature death. Uh, in this talk, I mainly apply the concept of structural violence to activities and contingencies of the coercive state in the form of the deportation regime. Uh, there's, a good, there's a growing literature now, finally, on this deportation regime. The notions of the regime and the production of violence uh, is seen by one of its, the founder of this theme, the guy called Nick de Genova, in a kind of combination of Foucault and then Gambin. And he talks about it uh, as, a, as a regime that basically enforces what he calls bare life. That means people who uh, don't have any kind of political life. And most immigrants in detention have no political life. It's a kind of hopeless situation and of a, in a state of what we call state of exception. The key purpose for uh, De Genova when he did his work uh, in establishing this regime is not so much to frighten immigrants but it was to discipline the entire working class, uh, to, to kind of threaten the entire working class uh, with the, what the properties of the state could be uh, if they step out of line. So the genius of this process is a form of what we call biopolitics, is that, it's that it extends to labouring classes in, in general. This is really interesting because if you think about where Trump says he draws his support, right? is from the white working class in the Midwest or whatever, and they kind of react you know, back to the immigrant because they feel so precarious. Of course, the same regime uh, will eventually come for them, and perhaps we might see this in, in the 2020 uh, elections. While the social expulsion and exploitation of the other, the immigrant, has been the long-term project of US elites, the immigration enforcement apparatus produces the great expulsion, as some people call it, Kahnström argues the new deportation regime has a long pedigree with a consistent racial and class-based violent state expulsion program. Uh, I argue that this present state apparatus and structure represents a new stage in the US elite's effort at population management, merging both a system of external border maintenance with an internal social control based on an amalgam of legal, bureaucratic, and, mil and militarized state agencies. The deportation regime's emergence is the end game in the process of constructing the deviant other. By bestowing anti-social properties on the target population, the immigrant as folk devil is symbolically created and the solution is social cleansing. The social suffering that this engenders is clear for all to see and takes many forms. 
For example, hundreds of thousands of children of deportees are left behind without one or both parents. We estimate now something like 250,000 children, 250,000 US children, citizens, have lost one or both parents to deportation. It's quarter of a million. Um, we also uh, have to think about uh, the rampant abuse in detention centres that escape the constitution, as a matter of fact, and resemble increasingly modern day concentration camps. If you saw recently this, high, this kind of hurried uh, kind of production of a camp underneath a bridge, that I think it was down in Texas, and hurriedly fortified with fences and so on and so forth. This, these, are like the, these are really like concentration camps. And by the way, the, a concentration, you should understand this historically, doesn't come from Germany, it comes from my country, Britain. And we first used it against the Boers, uh, that's the Dutch settlers in the Boer War uh, during the 1800s. And it's simply a concentration of people, right? Whether you kill them or not is another thing. But that's the, that's the whole object of it. And that's exactly what they're doing at the moment with, uh, uh, with uh, deportees. Um, finally, there is a powerful cultural context to the regime's violence and its social practices. Uh, this is the epoch, obviously, of capitalist late modernity, and it produces uh, this thing we call social bulimia. It's the co-presence of cultural inclusion and social exclusion of which the deportable immigrant falls victim. So when we did a study of Dominicans who were kicked out of, or were, were rejected, many of them from Brooklyn, actually, and, and uh, northern Manhattan, Washington Heights, and when we talked to them, we interviewed about 100 of them uh, in the early 2003, 2004, spent seven years, actually, going back and forth. And we asked them, you know, well, you know, why did you come, you know, to the United States, you know, and it was almost uh, always because of the American dream. And uh, as children, well, you had an American dream. No, 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 my mum had the American dream. My dad had the American dream. My family had the American dream. Or they came after the 1965 uh, Constitutional Revolution, after the United States invaded the Dominican Republic. And uh, Trujillo, uh, Trujillo, and... Um, Sorry, Balaguer uh, was picking up young people, accusing them of being part of the resistance, and they fled to this country, right? And uh, they didn't know where they were coming, they come to America, and whatever. So many of them didn't have real permanent residence. So I say to them, well, you know, why didn't you have, why don't you, why don't you, why aren't you a citizen? Why don't you have a US passport? And they would say, oh, almost invariably, we didn't know, Dave, we weren't citizens. I said, what do you mean you didn't know you weren't citizens? You've been, he said, well, we've been there since we're three or four or five years of age. We went back and forth all the time on the, deep, on the Dominican Republic. And mum and dad never told us we weren't citizens. We didn't know until we came, you know, they did a bit of prison time, right? usually for drugs. We didn't know we were deported. We didn't even know deportation laws existed. So this is this extraordinary kind of uh, thing in this country that, you know, you are included, all of you concluded culturally into the culture of capitalism. But for so many of you are socially excluded when you want to go and get a job, right? Because of race, class, and so on and so forth. So these are the kind of things behind the regime, right? The, these are kind of the sociological and criminological uh, explanations. But what about the ice machine? Where the hell did that come from? Right? How did that emerge? So on ICE's website, and it says, you know, this is not just any old machine. It says, over the years, ICE has achieved truly impressive results in protecting our nation's borders and enhancing public safety. Today, ICE is more than 20,000 strong. It's actually the largest police force in America, is ICE. With the presence in all 50 states and 48 countries. 48 countries. <laughs> Can you imagine? It has branches all over the world, not just here. We are galvanized towards our mission to promote homeland security and public safety through the enforcement of federal laws. As ICE's own website proudly states, the state bureaucratic and militarized system which oversees the categorization, apprehension, expulsion of non-citizens has achieved tr truly impressive results. This arm of the coercive state, founded in 2003, has violently and intrusively insinuated itself into almost every aspect of the nation's social, political and economic fabric with profound long-term destabilizing impacts on a broad spectrum of immigrant communities, both individually and collectively. The legislation having the single most impact on the regime's growth is undoubtedly 
the uh, Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigration Responsibility Act of 1996, which enabled a seismic escalation in rates of deportation and social injury, with a particular focus on non-citizens from Latin America and the Caribbean. And uh, this is, you know, I know that people have told, you know, explained about this, but to explain, you know, this whole thing of retroactive, uh, uh, um, going back to retroactive, almost double jeopardy uh, crimes that you may have uh, you may have committed if you've done 12 months. Uh, certainly, you're uh, you're uh, up for grabs if you've been accused of an aggravated felony. It's almost it's almost impossible uh, not to uh, not to be deported. Virtually the only legal defence, as I said to you, is about uh, the Convention Against Torture and uh, the Violence Against Women's Act. The tragic, irony, the tragic irony of the deportable subject should be obvious, since their only legal defence is that they will be the victim of the most extreme forms of state violence in the receiving country after being the victim of extreme state violence in the sending country. Now, what, is, uh, what, you know, what does ICE do? How does it come and pick you up? Uh, what are the programs? There are so many programs that you, 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 that you can fall under, uh, it, you know, and they're adding to them all the time. Let me just give you a couple of them. The Criminal Alien Program, CAP, which places ICE officials at state prisons to conduct immigrant screening. The National Fugitives Operation Program, NFGP, which has led to the arrest of more than 350,000 removable aliens since 2003. Secure Communities, a program once abandoned by Obama and now revived by Trump. The 287G program, which trains state and local police to identify, process and detain suspect immigrants. The Violent Criminal Aliens Section, VAS, a program that screens recidivist criminal aliens. The Joint Criminal Alien Removal Task Force, that identifies, investigates, and arrests criminal aliens. The detention enforcement and processing of vendors by remote technology, Deport Center, where immigrant deportables in the prison system are interviewed by agents. This is just some of the programs that you can fall under if you're a removable or deportable uh, alien. Necropolitics, and I'll finish here. ICE, in so many respects, has come to resemble a war machine and its system of surveillance, intelligence gathering, documentation, apprehension, detention, expulsion processes and acts, and all of these functions of ICE are now forms of necropolitics. I draw this from Mbibi's classic in intervention, 2003, when he writes, in imagining politics as a form of war, we must ask, what place is given to life, death, and the human body? How are they inscribed in the order of power? These questions posed by MBB seem to be unavoidable as we study the movements, practices, ideologies and outcomes of the ICE machine via our social anatomy project. In courtrooms, an expert witness of over 100 hearings in the last decade, I experienced ICE lawyers who cannot relate to the deportable alien as anything other than the subject object to be expelled forever from his or her social space. As such, the alien cannot be humanized. As the President makes clear, as well as in the early quote, in practically all his utterances on the subject of immigrants and immigrant communities. But we must remember that this space of the detained person, the removable, ob removable object, is a place in which that person has given life. It is not a dead space, but rather a lived space, a constructed space, a space of family, love, belonging, work, creativity, generativity, and social reproduction. But for the ICE agent, it is nothing more than an illegitimate space, a space of expulsion and therefore elimination. And I conclude, sorry, I have to cut all this short. The deportation regime is rapidly, rapidly entering a new stage in its development with such widespread abuse that it is tantamount to a regime of terror which practices necropolitics within structures of violence. The push for more detainees to be incarcerated, the proposed ending of bond, for those deportable aliens at large in civil society. The request for a massive increase in the budget to build more detention camps. The phenomenon of vigilante groups patrolling the border. The separation and caging of immigrant children. The loss of immigrant children within dysfunctional bureaucratic systems. All these are evidence of a building culture of exterminability. It comes from Anna Allen uh, on, uh, on fascism. Our response must be energetic and indefatigable resistance to a regime that is not simply a threat to immigrants, 
and their communities, but to the lifeblood of society and to any pretense that we can build a democratic project. Thanks very much. Uh, the neglected role of the state in the migration process of Puerto Ricans that Zolberg had noted more broadly has not been apparent. On the contrary, uh, analysts and scholars studying Puerto Rican population growth and migration have been keenly aware of the role of state institutions in the growth of the population and the migration process. Uh, I will outline how the role of the state at different levels of jurisdiction involving different polities have conditioned the movement of Puerto Ricans to other destinations, predominantly the United States. Uh, I argue that this role has been structured by the federal arrangement, structured not only uh, by a vertical form of federalism, which is the one that we are mostly uh, aware of, but also structured by a horizontal federalism that allows for the action of one state to, the ex to extend beyond its uh, 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 jurisdictional boundaries. I argue that the governments established uh, to rule Puerto Rico and is resident in form part also of the U.S. state. And it is for this reason that the government of Puerto Rico has been able to operate with so much leeway in relation to the citizen beyond the jurisdiction, uh, jurisdictional boundaries of Puerto Rico. Um, and, and as you can see here from this slide, uh, we can see the growth of the population, both uh, uh, Puerto Rican population in the United States. In blue, we see the total Puerto Rican population. Uh, in Puerto Rico, rather, uh, the, the blue is the population of Puerto Rico. Uh, in brown, we see the Puerto Rican population in the United States. And in gray, we see the Puerto Rican population that was born in Puerto Rico in the United States. So what we have seen is continued growth of both populations, with the exception of the Puerto Rican population in Puerto Rico. Beginning in 2005, the population in Puerto Rico declined for the first time in more than 250 years. A lot of it is explained, but not all of it explained, by the fact that Puerto Ricans are living in the island. Uh, so we see increasing migration uh, from the island. By the time the United States took over the island of Puerto Rico from Spain in 1898, there were about you know, a million people, just under a million people on the island, and about 600 in the entire United States. Um, during the following two decades, the Puerto Rican population in Puerto Rico continued growing, as it had been the trend under Spanish colonialism, that trend continued to grow, uh, continued until 2005. At the same time, the Puerto Rican population in the United States grew also, uh, particularly after 1917, when Puerto Ricans became U.S. citizens, and specifically after 1942, uh, 1945, after the World War II, uh, given specific policies of the government of the United States and the government of Puerto Ricans that facilitated the migration of Puerto Ricans to the United States. And we have seen that uh, growth continuing uh, since World War II tremendously in the United States, given on the one hand by migration, but also by uh, population, natural population growth. The intervening role of the state in the migration process is unavoidable in encompassing explanations of the migration process in general, uh, or the migration of a particular set of individuals in particular. In the case of Puerto Rico, however, the role of the state has been identified to be instrumental in the migration of Puerto Ricans from the island to other destinations, most notably the United States. But when we talk about the state, what state are we talking about? What is the state? Um, the United States is arranged in a federal system of government diffusing state power and capacity among its constituent units. The federal government, the several states and other subordinate jurisdictions of government. Uh, precisely, the federal government assumes the role of establishing who enters the territory uh, and the conditions under which those outsiders may come in. And this is generally understood as immigration policy. Um, but it does not, the federal government tends not to assume full responsibility for the incorporation of immigrants or migrants beyond perhaps extending residency and work requirements in the United States and at best uh, naturalizing uh, these foreign born uh, um, residents of the United States. By and large, uh, the process of migrant incorporation tends to fall haphazardly, informally, and inconsistently to sub-national units, to the states, to the counties, to the cities. These are the entities, the governmental entities, that tend to be involved in the process of incorporation of immigrants and migrants. In the United States, state power and capacity are further distributed and diffused in the separation between the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of government, in the case of the Puerto Rican migration, the federal arrangement of the United States political community. Sense of what? There is more than one government operating, whether the colonial metropolitan government, that is the United States, 
or the insular colonial governments in its different manifestations. Another way of, uh, or another point in, in regards to federalism to understand the role of the uh, state in uh, uh, migration is uh, to understand that uh, migration operates both in a uh, migration uh, operates both in a horizontal and in a um, vertical, uh, in a vertical and in a, in a horizontal plane. The Constitution establishes a hierarchy and boundaries between federal and state authorities on a vertical plane and horizontal plane that attempts to coordinate 50 co-equal states that most exist uh, peaceably, uh, coexist peaceably. The federal government must, must interact with the states and the states must interact with each other. Interestingly enough, even though we, nowadays we conceive as the federal government, as the federal state, that, that entity of the state, US state, has been involved in the migration process. For the first 100 years of the country's history, uh, the process of immigration was administered and managed by the federal state, not the federal government. The federal government did not want to have much to do with immigration. Um, moreover, uh, once the federal government began to arrogate to itself the responsibility of overseeing the immigration process in the late 19th century, it nevertheless delegated to the states many of those administrative functions until well into the 20th century. For more than a century, therefore, states such as New York or Maryland or California established immigration policy and regulatory practices. The motivation of, you know, in the case of these several states to becoming involved in the migration process um, was as a result of preservation and guarding of public welfare, and I'm quoting here. Uh, in, in, from this perspective, um, from this perspective, uh, on the part of governmental elites of the central states, uh, it was based on sovereignty, on sovereignty grounds, and concomitantly on what is known as the, the state's police powers doctrine, which is the right of state governments to regulate conduct for the benefit of the general welfare or the public good. State governments would take uh, the initiative in legislating and establishing policies that would impinge on immigration and immigrant policy even prior to any action by the federal government. And we have still to this day uh, manifestations of these state police powers, uh, uh, actions, uh, and policies. Uh, for instance, in the recent, relatively recent, Arizona Senate Bill uh, 1070, uh, or you know, California's Proposition 187. These are all state-based uh, actions that involve immigrant policy. Right? Um, Admissions of immigrants into the country uh, is a national state prerogative, uh, but even under those circumstances, uh, even if the state has invited uh, subnational governments to take part and share in the role of immigration enforcers, you know, uh, as my, my my colleague mentioned before, you know, the state has been involved since 1996. The the U.S. state has toughened up immigration and immigrant policies here in, here in the United States. One of the laws in 1996, the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act, in Section 287G, granted local state authorities, particularly police departments, to become enforcers of uh, immigration laws. Uh, at the same time, on the other side of the, the coin, we have, for instance, places like New York or San Francisco, etc., uh, that have granted, you know, informally known as sanctuary cities or sanctuary states. Uh, states that have, on the other hand, passed legislation uh, limiting or restricting the type of assistance state agencies and officials may provide to federal agents and agencies um, in their discharge and enforcement of immigration policy. So the point here is that you know immigration policy, immigrant policy, is not just a federal government responsibility or even involvement. It, it also entails other uh, uh, subnational units. Uh, by and large, uh, it is of national units that provide a more proximate response to immigrants as these appear in the midst of communities in the different states with counties and municipalities discharging the overwhelming bulk of services that may contribute to immigrant integration to a lesser or greater extent. Um, these relations between the na national federal state unit and the subnational state units in regards to immigrant and immigration policy therefore involve the vertical relationship. 
But in addition to this vertical relationship, there is also a horizontal type of relationship between subnational units. This horizontal federalism then entails a series of mechanisms which are constitutionally valid and available to prevent or, or mitigate friction between the different states when decisions from outside the boundaries of a given state affect the state uh, uh, where, where those residents are. One aspect of this horizontal relationship is capture in the state's extraterritorial powers. So extraterritoriality is evident to most people in the actions of the state in regards to its citizens when they are abroad, for instance, in the work of consular officers in a foreign country. You know, usually when you travel abroad, <coughs> if something happens to you abroad, one of the rights that you have as a citizen is to turn to your consul to seek redress of your country, right? Well, you can also apply a similar concept, not the same as the exact concept, but a similar concept to what is happening if you're a citizen of the state of New York and you are in, you happen to be in New Jersey. You know, there are, the, the, the state of New York may want to take your case if you travel to New Jersey or Mississippi or Hawaii. Uh, the doctrine of state story extraterritorial power stems from, from the assertion that a subnational state unit can regulate their citizens even when those citizens are out of the home state. The rights of the state to regulate their citizens emanates from the sovereignty that these states enjoy in the federal system of government of the United States. This doctrine stems from another sanction doctrine that I referred to before, states police powers. Therefore, in discharging their authority to regulate their citizens, for the purposes of safeguarding the general welfare and public good, subnational states may create regulations that extend beyond their borders. States' regulatory powers do not end at their borders. States have the power to apply their laws to their citizens out of state activities as well. Um, as a principle and a practice, extraterritoriality may then uh, afford states within the federal arrangement the ability to regulate their citizens beyond the confines of, of the state and also the ability, if they so choose, to exercise to act on behalf of the citizens while those remain outside of the confines of the state boundaries. In the case of Puerto Ricans, the application of this extraterritoriality was evident in the creation of state agencies uh, of the colonial government to manage the migration of Puerto Ricans from the island and the United States. Uh, to summarize very quickly, I will say that um, you know, how, how does Puerto Rico fit into the U.S. federal system? Well, you know, it, it was acquired by the United States government after the Spanish-Cuban-American War in 1898. Uh, the Treaty of Paris conferred the sovereignty of uh, Puerto Rico to the United States. The treaty and the constitutional provisions in the United States Constitution established the nature of the relationship between Puerto Rico and the United States. In exercising its sovereignty and plenary powers over Puerto Rico, the U.S. Congress gradually extended several measures of self-rule um, culminating in the present colonial arrangement. And judicial decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court have also established that Puerto Rico is not part, is not part of the United States, but it belongs to the United States. Mm. Uh, the Supreme Court has also held that even before Puerto Ricans became U.S. citizens in 1917, they were U.S. nationals and therefore entitled uh, to enter the United States without restrictions. Puerto Rico, therefore, remains part of the United States federal system since the U.S. Constitution has granted Congress the plenary powers to rule over territories and properties of the United States. And in exercise of that plenary power, Congress has extended self-government to Puerto Rico in several uh, measures. As a subnational unit of the U.S. state, Puerto Rico also maintains a horizontal relationship with several states of the Union. With a grant of autonomy, the U.S. Congress has extended to Puerto Rico Puerto Rico has also gained the ability to establish and execute its own police powers. It is the extraterritoriality of the governments of Puerto Rico have engaged in, in the context of horizontal federalism, that accounts for the large involvement of those state governments in the migration process of Puerto Rico to the United States and their settlement and integration into several states. It is for this reason that the governments of Puerto Rico have acted as protectors and benefactors, labor agents and workers advocates, lobbies and civic organizers of, city, of its citizens in the United States through institutional mechanisms, for instance, the Migration Division and the Puerto Rico Federal Affairs Administration. I also hand it to you, uh, and I'll just make one quick change here. And these are, for instance, um, 
And this is a listing of the different laws, uh, different regulations, and different uh, state action at the different levels, federal, state, and municipal, along the lines uh, that I described before in terms of this horizontal and this um, vertical uh, federalism that explain many of the actions taken by the state, the U.S. state, uh, as well as the you know, subnational units in explaining the presence of Puerto Ricans in the United States. The newly formed Forum on Migration here at St. Francis College. Thank you to our organizers and guests for being here today. I heard it described as a labor of love, uh, but while it is deeply personal, it's also labor intensive. So I very much appreciate those who organized and participated in today's events. It is easy to see if only by perusing the names and accomplishments of the persons who participated in both this conference and the first conference last month, Coming to America in the 21st Century, that as the President said earlier this morning, immigration is not their problem, it is our problem. It is complex and multifaceted, and folks on all sides are passionate about their positions. This is one reason it is so important to have these kinds of discussions, particularly in academic spaces, so that we can come to learn, understand, and appreciate both our differences and similarities. This community of scholars, legal professionals, activists, and ethicists from all parts of the globe participated in this common goal over these two days, and there is much work to be done. And it is fitting that a program such as the Forum on Migration originates here at St. Francis. St. Francis College has a proud heritage of preparing students to take their places as leaders in their fields and to becoming contributing members of society. With a mission founded on the ideals and teachings of St. Francis of Assisi, the college plays a vital role in the community and in the lives of our students and alumni. St. Francis College is a college whose Franciscan and Catholic traditions underpin its commitment to academic excellence, spiritual and moral values, social responsibility, and collaborative service-oriented leadership. And we now add the Forum on Migration to our Institute for Peace and Justice and our post-prison program um, as exemplars of this spirit. Um, today we have welcomed um, various people from the nonprofit organizations, academic research, political institutions, and those shaping immigration policies, many of whom uh, have been on our campus before, um, and we have much more work to do with many more events to come. Uh, St. Francis College strives for success in achieving goals of promoting academic excellence, advancing a thriving intellectual community, development of the whole person, and enabling the transition from student to citizen of the world. We do this by excellence of instruction, small classes, and professors' individual attention to each student, which creates a hospitable community atmosphere based on mutual trust and respect. Recognizing the original Franciscan understanding of hospitality as a challenging, risk-taking social contract I'd like to just focus for one minute on that word, hospitality. Hospitality is a primary charism of the Benedictine monks. The rule of St. Benedict, which was wisely guided Benedictine communities for over 15 centuries, urges that all guests who present themselves are to be welcomed. Hospitality is a fierce discipline. To welcome others, to recognize that despite vast differences, the diverse human family is part of the same belonging and we need one another to survive and thrive. Hospitality is simply a working out of the truth. Hospitality means not only welcoming people with their concrete needs, but also making a safe space for the expression of their differing perspectives and ideas. Perhaps our first US immigration policy, uh, George Washington said, the bosom of America is open to receive not only the opulent and respected stranger, but the oppressed and persecuted of all nations and religions, whom we shall welcome to a participation of all of our rights and privileges. In these challenging times, perhaps more than ever, it is important that we challenge ourselves to embrace this spirit of hospitality, not only in our homes, but in our educational institutions, our places of worship, and in fact, our lives. Such an open-minded and open-hearted stance is radical, first of all, in its fearlessness, 
Fear bolts the gates, hunkers down, and hurls epithets over the fortress walls. Let this not be the tale we tell. Let us rather follow in the steps of St. Francis, who once said, where there is charity and wisdom, let there neither be fear nor ignorance. May we all strive for this radical idea of hospitality, and may we use all that we have learned today and in the days to come to drive us toward that goal. Thank you again all for being here, and know you are always welcome at St. Francis College.